Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I am so excited to have a really amazing guest for you guys. I have Jet Setting Jasmine. She is a psychotherapist, an adult performer, an adult director, producer, and podcaster. Jasmine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So I just want to give a quick shout out to my girl, Asa Akira at the Pornhub podcast. That was the first time that I heard your interview. And I just thought it was such a brilliant interview. You had so many things to say that were not only incredibly fascinating, but I thought like really important. And I just thought I really want to have her on my show, but you know, maybe give it a little bit of time. So I'm not just like (laughs) scooping you up right behind um, your experience your appearance on the Pornhub podcast, but, um, thank you. I love, um, you know, I love my people at Pornhub. I love Asa and she has great taste in guests. So I thought perhaps I will bring Jasmine here too. (laughs) I really appreciate that. Thank you for following up with me and for giving another opportunity to have more discussion about the things that I'm really passionate about as well. Yeah. So let's start off um, with your production company and specifically what you film. Um, Your production company is called Royal Fetish Films. So fill us in a little bit about what you guys are all about. Yes. So Royal Fetish Films is one of our love children uh, between King Noir and I. And we really set off to create um, adult work that's not necessarily under any particular genre other than making sure that there is representation of black folk um, bipoc folk in the way that they want to be represented Um, we saw that there was a huge gap in the industry and just talking to other what would be our peers uh, saying you know like i would watch more porn if or I never seen myself represented in this way. I didn't know that these things could exist for me because of lack of modeling. Um, And so our company really just sets out to create content that is from the guise of BIPOC folk um, that is putting the hands, putting the camera in the hands of women, um, putting the hands of people, putting the camera in the hands of people who have a different scope around sex and expressions of sex. And so that's what Royal Fetish Films has been up to over the last 10 years. Um, We are pivoting, of course, like all of us in the adult industry, figuring out ways to do our business safely, um, to bring the same quality and the same level of entertainment, but keeping, you know, performers safe as well as making sure our family is safe. Um, And so we have been exploring what it's going to be like to create the boutique of porn. Uh, So small sets, smaller, even smaller, more intimate, um, giving performers an opportunity to really connect and and create chemistry from a distance in the way that we have learned over the last year and a half how to create trusting relationships when we can't be in the same space and then how that can translate into building trust when we're all still trying to like figure out like, do we hug? Do we handshake? Do we kiss? Do we like spit from afar to each other, (laughs) you know? Um, And so, you know, we just don't want to take for granted that um, just because we are sex workers and we use our bodies, that we're not having some of the same experiences that the rest of the world is having having in terms of reconnecting. Um, And also how can we use this this opportunity to help people reconnect on set as a way to like enhance, enhance the art, enhance the experience. So our Royal Fetish boutique shoots are um, starting to become like my favorite project is how to create the safest, most intimate, high, high chemistry, sex, uh, sex energy driven space to create art. Could you maybe give us some examples of like how you achieve that? Yeah, so um, we're just coming off of our Orlando, which became very um, commonly known through the the shoot house as Horlando, um, because we did definitely create some 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 stuff. Um, this particular particular shoot pod was really really exciting how it came together. It became like the DILF and MILF shoot. So the performers that we worked with were all moms and dads in the industry that had like this, you know how we come to the table as parents, like I got something to lose as if single people with no children don't. Um, But there is a certain level of increased responsibility of having to care for someone who is totally reliant on your decision-making, right? Right. 
And that's something that in our industry oftentimes is not respected or thought about. Like, what is it to be a parent? What what level of trust do you need with other performers to do your job in a way that maybe other people don't have to consider? So for this MILF and DILF shoot, um, it was important that everyone was vaccinated and was able to show um, proof of vaccination and testing, not just talent testing, but also COVID testing and was um, able to communicate their needs in advance of coming to said shoot with you know, what time do you do your mommy calls? What time do you take your daytime calls so we could all be respectful of that in our quarantine house? Um, what kind of diet do you are you accustomed to? So that way we know what the house needs to have because there's not gonna be any in and out. We have to establish, you know, our, our agreement, our boundaries to sort of live together for the next three to three to five days and create content. But with full consideration that you're a whole person who has been probably for a year and a half in some level of isolation. Um, and so making sure that the space that we created, everyone had their own private space where you can disconnect from the group activity, um, where you have your own bathroom and, and all of these things that, you know, it seems like, really, do you need to do all of that? But yeah, when you're talking about people sharing not only their physical and their, their sexual space, but... What is it like to just be in the presence of people who you haven't been quarantining with that you have to sort of create this trust um, and regulate your own anxieties and theirs all in the same space? So it was a lot of building chemistry prior to getting there and also making sure our checks and balances were completely transparent. Um, it was working with a COVID compliance officer that works on mainstream sets to help us create the safest possible scenario um, that we can create in a porn set. It also meant following up and making sure that people left feeling okay and following up with their with them and their family households and going, hey, we're all asymptomatic since we've returned. Can everyone else check in? It's actually caring about the people that you work with. Um, that's Imagine all, that. <laughs> that's all we're doing. <laughs> that's all we're doing. And I felt like we've always cared. Um, but this post-COVID situation has given us an opportunity to really demonstrate that in ways that we haven't really had to um, in the past. It's like lip service could go a long way in the past, but now there are really some clear ways to demonstrate how to show someone that I care about you as a full person, not just for the hour that you're going to be shooting content with me. It's been interesting how COVID has really kind of changed the adult, I mean, not the only the world, obviously, but also like the adult industry specifically, you know, there's been a lot of like internal conversations about, um, bound, you know, women's boundaries being pushed on set men, men as well. I don't want to leave men out. Um, sex workers perform boundaries being pushed on set. Um, you know, obviously, uh, representation of BIPOC performers, you know, it, I think that it really like hit the pause button um, be, and kind of had everybody step back and think about like, God, you know, like wh what are we doing, you know, and, and looking at work differently. I know, you know, I can say specifically for, you know, my clients that I work for specifically, you know, Mind Geek really like took step back. And even though they didn't have any um, accusations against them when, you know, people were going around talking about um, specific companies that they felt like had violated them in mm -hmm. certain ways and, mm -hmm. you know, other performers who pushed their boundaries, you know, they really stepped back and said, oh my God, let's like make sure that we're creating a safe space for performers. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I don't know. I think a lot of us didn't realize like how, how big of a problem it was. Like you heard things here and there, but I think it wasn't until quarantine and, you know, the success of platforms like OnlyFans where suddenly models became so much more financially independent that they felt like they could finally speak up and they felt safe doing so. They weren't worried about being blacklisted. And I really feel like that we're more considerate of performers as, as people now, at least I know that the people that I work for are. And and honestly, if, if, if nothing else, but for business standpoint, right? It's like, it's, it's better for your bottom line if you're good to the, the performers that create your product. That's it, right? So it's kind of like, it's a no brainer, even without looking deeply into the mor morals of a company or a, of a group of people, just it's good business. And when your, your performer knows their worth, 
oh, they're going to let you know as well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And I do think that's exactly what, what happened is like, oh, so you mean I could be creating X amount just by being myself or by taking matters into my own hand? Okay. And it doesn't mean that I want to pull away from all of these other entities. It just means I have some negotiating t chips and that's good business. It's good business for performers to diversify their worth uh, in, in the way and to understand your worth, to know what value you bring. Um, and it's great for companies to uh, have a better understanding that they have an informed consumer and they also have an informed contractor now. So things, do you know, you know, so you know, like I, I completely agree with you and I don't measure the intent anymore. Like why, why are they making this change? It's like, do they make it? Yes. Better for the performer. Uh-huh. Good for the consumer. Awesome. That's good enough for me. Yeah, I agree. I know that there were some directors that kind of complained, you know, oh, so-and-so doesn't want to shoot for big brands anymore because they make so much money on their OnlyFans. And, you know, um, but I, I just feel like I would so much rather work with people who really want to be there and who really want to be on set because they enjoy the experience yeah. rather than they're there just for the paycheck. If it's only about the paycheck and you can get that paycheck on OnlyFans and so you don't want to come to set, like, good for you. That's great. You know, I want to work with people who want to be there yeah. and, and contribute to like the experience as a whole. So I personally think it's, it's made for a better shooting environment. So what I really want to talk to you about, um, is your work as a psychotherapist and how do you juggle that with being a sex worker and how do you establish boundaries? Do you ever have clients who know what you do for a living? Do you ever counsel other sex workers what would you be your advice to sex workers who are looking for therapy that's non-judgmental and, you know, will not immediately pinpoint the root of all their problems is the fact that they do porn. Yeah. That is like everyone's sadly everyone's experience or fear to even have a therapeutic experience. It's, it is exactly what you mentioned. Um, yeah, so I, I am a forward-facing sex worker and I am also a forward-facing therapist in the same, same sentence. So um, my clients do know um, the work that I do. It is something that I disclose. If for some reason they happen to like Find me on in 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 on Google first hit for a therapy and I come up and they have no idea of the other work, which rarely ever happens. Most of my recommendations are sex workers, um, family members of sex workers, um, people that are in the quote unquote uh, lifestyle that um, are honestly have gone through a couple of therapists where they are like, you know what, the next one better be a porn performer that is also a therapist, otherwise. <laughs> It's a no-go. Um, so usually by the time people find me, they're looking for either me specifically through a recommendation or they're looking for a unicorn. And I'm like, hey, that's me in this in this department. Uh, in, in, in terms of boundaries, you know, I I don't um, see people that I've that I work with. And there has been a situation where um, over in the last couple of years where um, something I filmed and something a client filmed ended up on the in the same on the same um, DVD or whatever uh, series, and that was un unsuspecting for both of us. It was really surprising, and um, but thankfully we had that initial conversation of our worlds may cross because it is a very small world, um, and when that happens, I will never be like, oh, that's my no. Um, and I will always leave it to you because I am openly disclosed who I am um, to the world. I will always leave it to you to define how you know me, if you know me at all. And um, we talk about like the fact that, you know, it, it's kind of like any other therapeutic relationship. If we lived in the same neighborhood, I might see you at the local bar or I may see you grocery shopping. And I don't do all this to go grocery shopping. So <laughs> it might scare you, you know, and like we should talk about that. If you're like, hey, I feel like you wear a mask literally. to therapy. <laughs> um, So, you know, I, I use kind of the very same premise that I would use in any other job. Um because the reality is, is it uncomfortable for you to see your therapist outside of your session? And if so, how can we work through that? And if it's something that we don't want to work through, then let's find another and a better match for you. Um, and so that that has usually, and again, most of my 
clients are performers, so we have already normalized sex and the, and and seeing sex for performance and sex for money. Um, we've already come to some agreements uh, on on that by the nature of our work, um, so that tends not to be problematic. Um, in that situation that I shared with you, that was like, oh, this is too close for comfort for both of us. Um, we had a conversation uh, in terms of if we felt that this would hamper our relationship. Um, if we felt that we needed to have a face to face to kind of just talk about the raw feelings of like seeing someone in a different capacity. Um, and we both agreed that we did really great work with one another and we were coming to the end of our sessions and we would, we could consider this kind of like a, huh, the world is really small and, and be able to move forward. So that, that has been my experience with this, um, disclosing. I would share to sex workers if during your first session, if you feel that you're having a hard time articulating what you do for a living or anything that feels a little challenging, and it's not necessarily because it's a hard thing for you to share, but the person sitting across from you is making it difficult for you to find those that verbiage or making it difficult for you to have that entry point, Remember you're shopping and you could like put that dress back on the rack and say, you know what? It just doesn't fit right. I don't know something about it. And like, keep shopping, keep shopping. Yeah. You know, um, I think oftentimes it's like by the time we agree in our minds to go to therapy and we go through whatever the appointment setting is, whatever the insurance bullshit is, we feel kind of stuck with whoever we meet um, because of the effort that we've put into it. But there's so much like your your return is in that investment in finding someone that you can be fully yourself with. Ask the hard questions. Ask your therapist. Are you a consumer of porn? How do you feel about consumption of porn? Push, like, it's part of our work as therapists to challenge our own biases and to be able to also say, you know, the things that you present to me, I don't feel that I am equipped to do that. And so... If your therapist can't send you for a second opinion or to uh, make a referral or answer questions that are gonna be the difference of you being able to get medical care or not, therapy is medical care, then put that back on the rack and, and keep at it. Um, I've also have told a lot of sex workers right now, I know how difficult it can be to find a sex work friendly, a LGBTQIA friendly, a Black Lives Matter friendly, a trans, like all the all the friendlies, right? Uh, uh, fat friendly, a all of the things that we really do need people to show up with in our most vulnerable space. If you're having a hard time with that, seek out some support groups in the meantime. Look for some supplemental support until you can find your, your you know, your person or your team. Um, that looks like Pineapple Support has several support groups. And what I also love about that is like, then people start talking like, oh, I see this person and they're really good. Oh, they might know someone here. So just being a part of a support group sometimes can give you the resources to finding more of a one-on-one -on -one, um, or even tips on how to interview your therapist. So supplemental support where you can't find the one-on-one -on -one until you do. You know, I'm really glad that you mentioned kind of shopping for your therapist and how you don't have to feel stuck with whoever you see, because I do feel that a lot of people feel that way because you're right. It is a lot of effort to find somebody to go through the insurance. And I think also too, it's, it's such a hard thing for people to actually go out and seek mental health help that when they like finally do it and find somebody, they don't want to like start all over again and try to find somebody else. But you know, from my experience, somebody who's had a lot of therapy, I have definitely had quite a few therapists who did not help me at all. And I remember specifically one who I felt was actually quite dangerous. So a lot of people know that I'm a recovering alcoholic and I had a horrible drinking problem. And when I was trying to get sober, I remember I saw this one therapist, I saw her like two times. And the second time she said to me, and I can't remember what predicated this, but she said saying like, well, maybe you're just, maybe you're not actually an alcoholic. Maybe you're just like depressed or something like that. And I remember feeling like that's a very dangerous thing to say to an alcoholic because we will look for any excuse to not, to Have that like, to, right, exactly. So that we can go out and drink ourselves to death. Like that's what we do. And like, I had already at that time, I had, 
I had been sober for seven years. I had relapsed. I was in the middle of like a four and a half year relapse trying to get mm-hmm. sober again. So I like, I knew I was an alcoholic. I, there was no You're the doubt expert on you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when she made that suggestion, I was like, this is a bad place for me to be. Like if I, you know, and, and, and I left and I, and I went and saw a couple more people that I didn't like until mm-hmm. I settled on the woman that I have now, who's incredible. And she really, really helped me get sober. And I've been sober for almost three years now. Congrats. Again, thank you. Yeah. Um, but I had to go through a lot of people and, uh, you know, there were a lot of therapists that I saw that definitely didn't help, but I just want to stress to people who are, who are looking for a therapist. Like if you don't like the person that you're seeing, it's not therapy. It's the person that you're seeing. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I get more like sad when I'm like ghosted on like, you know, like an app, like, I don't know, whatever I'm using Bumble or some shit than I am when a, a client ghosts me. It's like, no good. Like, this is good. You, you're, you're literally making that first decision of saying like, ah, I'm getting treatment, but not with her. Like, good. That's good. That's actually a good thing. That's you saying something about this is not going to lead me to my goal. And that's okay. Like, we understand as therapists, we are providing a service that you are not required to take as is. It should be a relationship that you feel that you can build. And I, and for those that might be listening, because I know therapists are listening with their fingers in their ears, like, I hate this porn lady speaking on behalf of our industry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm the one they want to interview. But for, for us as therapists, we also have to be completely honest with like, you know what, my experience with alcoholism goes this far and I'm not sure what I'm seeing right now. I am not, you're, you're sharing with me this and you are the expert in this on you. And this is what I, and what I'm feeling and what I'm seeing feels contradictory to that. Maybe we need to get a third party involved. Maybe we need to, you know, maybe there's work that I need to do to better understand you as the expert. Tell me about a time when you've been here before, Holly, the expert, you know? And it's like, that's, this is all, all I'm, it's like, I just want to be brought into your life. I'm not trying to control it, manipulate it, or be the expert on it. And I do think sometimes we miss the mark um, because of that power dynamic and that wanting to be the expert. It's like, I've read a lot of books. I've passed all of the classes. I've done my clinical hours. I am an expert at that. Everything else is my client's invitation to orient me to their life. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a, such a great way to put it. I ended up seeing an addiction specialist There you go. Um, mm-hmm. because that's, that's what I needed. That's what you needed. Um, yeah. So, and it, and it worked, it worked out for me, but I'm glad I stuck with it, you know, because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Didn't I didn't want to. I didn't want to keep looking for people. I didn't want to have to tell my story all over again to a different person, you know, but even with that, oh, I'm so sorry. So sorry to cut in, but like t- writing, I, I suggest like write the story. If you know you're shopping, you know, like write, write out, write the story out, send it in advance of your appointment. Can you read this? Do you think that I should I come in? Let me, let me tell you something. <laughs> we are customers of healthcare. We're, we are, we're not trained that way. You know, we're trained to take whatever is given to us and that the provider is the, you know, the end all be all. But the reality is there's no, there's no medicine. There's no psychotherapy to practice with no client. You know, I say the same thing about porn performers. You know, it's like, as a performer, it's like, no, I run this industry. There's no porn without me. You remember that. Everybody who's telling me what to do, none of y'all are taking off your clothes and, and showing your shit, so don't. The same thing with my clients. Now, you're not all bearing your your soul, so you don't tell me what, what I need, you know? And so I always often say, if you don't want to tell that story over and over again, and I, I mean this from physical health to mental health, You can share it. I mean, obviously be mindful of a page or two, right? Um, You know, it's like we we should be realistic with the expectations. Um, I've been doing this even with my children before going to any appointment. Write what you want to discuss. Write what you want them to know about you. Because when we get into that space and our emotions are high and they're low for time, we can still have our needs met. 
you know that to me has always been that's what i used to search for my pediatrician we wrote down our shit all of our like granola parent questions and if that person walked in there and they either did not say i haven't had a chance to read it let me take a look at it right now or i read it and i'm ready to address these with you then i already knew i could leave now you aren't even interested in my expertise about my body, my family, my mental health, my story to date. So we can sort of like, you know, and, and we've walked out of pediatrician's office fast when they come in, they go, what paper? Oh, no, I didn't. No, I asked the questions. Oh, OK, you can ask the next client the questions because we're not the right ones for you. So, yeah. There's little things that we should be putting in front of our providers so that we're not wasting our time. Um, and, and honestly, we're even giving them an opportunity to showcase that they can meet our needs. Right, right. Yeah, I love that. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to come right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast, too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, and we are back. So Jasmine, I know that you have a polyamorous relationship with your partner, King Noir. So can you explain to us how that works for you? Because I know that that kind of relationship can be different for different people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is, it's even different for us. Like um, one of the things in, it is important for me to say that we have a polyamorous relationship because King is a polyamorous individual. He came into our relationship. Um, with a clear understanding that he wanted to be able to explore um, his relationship style of polyamory openly and freely in, in whatever relationship structure we were going to build together as a unit. And so the first couple of years, it was part of my exploration of just exploring non-monogamy, um, getting a better understanding of what it meant for him to be poly in a relationship, for me to challenge like my lifetime of growing up as a serial monogamous um, and seeing serial monogamy my entire life and not really understanding why anyone couldn't quite get it right. Um, and like, oh, like you've always grown around people that were oriented differently, um, but didn't have the language, the label, the permission or the desire to learn a different style. Um, so the first couple of years of our relationship was really my own exploration and his exploring what is it like to be free to be in a relationship. What I have come to learn is I am more of a sexual opportunist in our relationship. And what that means to me is like, if there is a sexual opportunity and it looks like it might be a good time, like I'm willing to try it out and to explore that. Do I need to like build a deep connection with that person and follow through with them and date them? No. Um, King, more so, yes. And, and he can have um, casual sex experiences and uh, sexual opportunities as well. But he is definitely um, more inclined to be attracted to a deeper connection with people. And so um, it has been fun for us to kind of like for me to go, you know what, like, you're enough. 
like you know trying to meet your needs and and my own um and some of the other things that i am so in love with that are not even people like you know my relationship to my work my relationship to like changing my hair every couple of days like i love that shit, right and i want to be able to do that um but being somebody's like ace when i'm already someone's ace even being someone's B, okay, like I, it's like a lot. It feels like a lot. And that has been really the beauty of our polyamorous relationship has been like, you can do that, which, which fills your cup. You know, he's like, at night, he is like texting with a big old grin on his face. And I'm like, yeah, see, I don't want to be doing that with someone else. I want to be laying down in my bed, like breastfeeding our son and, and, you know, off, dreaming about something else but i i also love that i don't have to be that to him either um that a lot of the things that he is able to explore to talk about to do with his other partners could be things that i'm not interested in doing um or that i've done before and don't want to do again like all, all of these things and just being able to go like oh you can I don't have to do that with you and you still get the benefit of having that life experience without me feeling guilt for it um, or resentment for it or feeling the other thing, which is more likely is like this high pressure to do things I don't want to do. And that has been my relationship yeah. history for a really long time um, is doing things. And so even the poly thing, it's like, I... I don't want to, um, I also don't, I mean, excuse me, I don't want to also have these deep relationships. Can we be poly in this way? Absolutely. And so, you know, we have done a lot of like reading and learning from other couples and going to these workshops and it has come down to like what works for our lifestyle, for our lived experience. And we've borrowed like this works for this. I love this concept let's do a little of this oh we're pregnant now let's take some of that away oh the kids are getting more independent let's add some of that back and and it's been so fluid and that has made it fun it's made it challenging as shit at different points in time but it's the most freeing relationship um even the most freeing friendship that i've ever had i i love how you well first of all the the ability to be fluid in a relationship, I think is so important. And that's a mark that so many people miss because our relationships change over time, right? Like the way that we were, you know, the way that my husband and I were when we first started dating is different now, you know, five years later and we're married and we have a baby yeah. Um, we don't have the same kind of relationship and, and that's okay. And sometimes I have to work with like my feelings of guilt of like, you, you know, how I am different, how I respond to him differently sexually now, because I have a baby and, and, and he's like, okay with that. And sometimes it's hard for me to recognize that he's okay with that. And I think another mistake that a lot of people make in relationships is that they want their significant other to be everything to them, to occupy every single space, right? To be able to satisfy them intellectually, like emotionally, physically, spiritually, all these things. You can't do it. That's so much. It's so much to ask of a person. And I don't think that that necessarily means that you need to be polyamorous and right. you need to have like other romantic relationships with other people. But mm -hmm. I think it's healthy to have you know, other relationships, like say friendships with other people that could fulfill you in a way that perhaps your partner isn't going to be able to fulfill, fulfill you with, you know, like you don't have to do everything and have your partner be a part of every single part of your life. You know, there's this example and it happened, it happened a couple, just a couple of weeks ago when I was like, whoa, like it was one of those like, yeah, like I've really grown. And, and I know that because I know like just being together for 10 years and like still like the things that I, that I love um, continue to grow, like all, all the things I, I, I was like, I know, I know we're doing good. But one of those moments of validation that I'm like, yeah, but I'm doing like really good. Right. <laughs> and we were um, we were in a, a, a shoot space and. I was watching over a couple of days, like King make these um, this amazing connection with this other person that was there. Um, and they were like, they play the same games. They have an interest in um, shoes, like all of these things that usually he's telling me about. And I am listening because I care about him. I'm not listening because I care about the topic. Um, and he's well aware, you know, it's not, it's not like one of those things. I'm like, babe, tell me more about those sneakers. It's one of those things like, 
really you want those how much money do we need to make so that you can have those i don't care what they are right um but i'm hearing him talk about like the additions of, and the the material that they're made of and like all of this and i'm like i'm actually being turned on by my partner's passion in which he's sharing with this other person about like totally non-sexual things um things the sapiosexual aspect they were talking about articles that they read and like fascinating articles but give me the summary because there's like a lot of words about things that are like sort of important to me um but like she was just like you know like oh and then have you read the response to that and and you know they and i was just like yeah i don't want to be any of this but i do love that i can witness it and i love how excited he's getting and i'm not having to put forth any energy and i know that i'm going to get the benefit of this conversation and it's not like the direct benefit he's going to come and like shower with me with gifts because she provide but he's more relaxed he's happier he feels heard he feels seen he feels that what he's what's important to him is validated through this other person also feeling the same thing and i remember saying like y'all should go out on a date because like wow like this is cool you know and they both kind of like laughed and it was just a moment where the three of us were like wow needs were being met by each other um and it's harmless and it's beautiful and everyone is better because of it and i can remember you know take me back 15 15 years ago i'd be like who is this bitch and why does she know so much about sneakers make it stop you know <laughs> Um, whereas now it's just like, oh yeah, like, please talk. Cause now I could be on my phone, right? Like looking at pink shit with flowers or whatever it is I like. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really, uh, that's a great example. So do you ever like, do you ever deal with feelings of jealousy? Like on, on either side, are there ever moments of jealousy? And like, how do you handle that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, it really is just just being aware of them. Before I used to try to fight them and usually, and you know, this is years back, like trying to fight it um, usually meant either trying to make the thing go away, you know, like, like, hear me out why this is a terrible idea. Hear me out why she's terrible, right? Um, the second phase of that would be overcompensating for that feeling of just like, no, like balls to the wall, just go do it. Just go do it. Just go, and then, and then be in the inside like, <gasps> he's gonna go do it you know um and so what that balance more like is like oh that makes me feel uncomfortable let me think about why what am i scared of and like literally telling him like i'm scared that you've seen me look like shit for a year and a half day in and day out and something is gonna show up sparkly with its eyebrows done and its toes manicured and pedicured and it's gonna make me feel even you know even scruffier and like okay that's a you thing it really is right it's like you know he's not saying like don't do your eyebrows or don't fix up your feet you know um and so just sometimes being able to talk it out and going like okay yeah so i need to either figure that out or or i need to sit in it this is going to be one of those moments that's going to be a yucky feeling until it's over and i've moved on um and then at other times he's like you know i just doesn't feel worth it, it doesn't feel worth it. You working through the jealous feelings or me being able to help help validate you through this doesn't feel worth it to that other thing. Um, so sometimes we just have to go like, you know what? Mm, let's pause. Um, and then there, there are other moments that are just fine where I'm just like, my needs are met. I'm happy that you can get your needs met. Um, today, as we're... we're on other ends of the coast right now he messaged and he says like this nice couple that he's going to be working with um they're likely going to go to the gym socially distance mass and then they're going to go to a dispensary socially distance and mass and je girl jealousy from top of my head to the bottom of my feet i want to go someplace cool with friends i don't even, like, <laughs> I don't even want to go to a gym i just want to go someplace and so you know, recognizing this is not a poly jealousy thing. This is not, I think they're going to take my spot. Um, they're going to have babies and bank accounts together. This is like, you're doing something fun and I, I don't have anything super exciting going on over here. So I feel jelly and nothing is going to change about it. You should still go and do that thing because it's good. It's safe and you're going to be happy for it. And I should just like, you know, tap myself on the forehead because I didn't make any plans. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fair assessment. 
So uh, you mentioned that you have uh, children. And one of the things that you and Asa talked about, which, you know, I thought was a really great conversation because, you know, Asa is obviously a mother. Um, I'm a new mother. And this is a topic that I just think is so important that a lot of people are loath to talk about because, you know, the idea of discussing like anything about the adult industry and like anything about children should never like be in the same room. But I mean, we have to acknowledge that a lot of sex workers or people that work in the adult industry are also parents. So like, how do you navigate those waters? So yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And I think it's also important that most of the consumers of porn and adult industry related products and services are also parents as well, you know? And so I think, you know, having the conversation, we're not just having some special private club conversation. We're actually having a conversation about society and about really what life actually looks like. And that's, the I think, part of the challenging part is like people don't want to leave fantasy world. But in order to create fantasy and to create fantasy world really well, we should actually address real world. Right. Um, and so, you know, I think it has been so important for me to discuss being a parent as a performer, because some of the some of the things that people try to use to target and to to hurt performers is like, what are your kids going to think? And like being able to have a response to that is like, in my opinion, it's pretty fucking badass. Like, oh, I'm glad that you asked. Let me point you to this podcast where my daughter shares what she thinks, you know, um, I know you're getting sound on the other side, so. Yeah, I'm going, what I'll do is I'll mute myself when I'm not talking. Okay, um, cool. So you don't hear that. Okay. So, you know, um, and also like doxing, you can't dox anything that's already out there, right? I am a parent. I do create porn. I don't create porn with my children, <laughs> you know, um, making that clear distinction because that's, Unfortunately, that's sort of, um, it's the stigma that has been attached, right? That porn performers or people in the adult industries are perverts and perverts are pedophiles. When all of those three things can be independent of themselves. Um, but there's been that, you know, uh, how do you say it? Uh, the, um, oh, I can't think of the word, but, but anyways, where people have made that a part of our stigma that we have to be so worried about, you know, also where is a safe space to talk about your children and work? And so the way that I've, I've asked people to think about this is, what is the level of, of share that we do about with any other profession? How many people work at as a barista and come home and tell their children how many cups of coffee they made? Like, that's rare. It's, it's, it has no place and no relevance, typically. Um, and I could say that to someone who is a law enforcement officer. There's no relevance to coming home and sharing the details of the work that you do. It's not appropriate to that child. And so the same thing when it comes to adult work, people often ask, like, how do you balance? How do you, how do you share with your kids the type of work that you do? And I ask them, before I ask that question, can you share with me how you share with young people in your life the kind of work that you do? And they're like, well, I'm just a banker. Okay, well, talk to me. How much do you, every night that you come home, do you share with your, they don't really want to know that. Oh, same for my kids. They're really not interested um, in aspects of my work. And if they were, I would be able to explain it to them at the most age appropriate way. So if my two year old says, which he does, mommy working, yes, mommy has to go upstairs and work now. That's the exact same response I give him when I have to go see a therapy client. It's the same thing that I use when I'm seeing a kink, a kink client. Nothing has changed about the context of that two year old's understanding of work. My 16 year old, she says, uh, mom, I want you to go to this thing. I can't, I have a shoot this weekend that's gonna keep me out of the house until Sunday. My 16 year old does not wanna know, well, what kind of shoot, what company is it for? Exactly what are you, are you gonna be doing pretty girls first and then is there gonna be video? Absolutely not, no interest. And there's no level of appropriateness in which I would share that with her. Um, if she, you know, we did have a conversation, I am going to start to be putting more explicit work on the internet. We need to block each other. Um, we need to be aware that some people may find out information about me and they may try to bully you. Do you have any questions about it? How can we work through this? Even in that conversation, I have still not shared with her 
who I shoot with, how I shoot, what positions I shoot with, how much the content is sold for, what websites it's, it's on. My 20 year old, our conversations have matured as she has matured. We can talk about adult toys. We can talk about, we can even talk about what sites I find are problematic that maybe her and her partner want to steer clear of. Um, but it's appropriate, she's an adult now. So, you know, I just, I, I think when we normalize the conversation, I, I appreciate you asking me to continue having this conversation on your show for your audience, um, other moms in the industry. If we normalize it and we kind of ask people like to look for examples of how much your parents shared about their work problems um, and how that had an impact or didn't have an impact on you, we could use those exact same, same examples when it comes to porn. Uh, it's just kind of like, it's my secret service job. I think the biggest thing, the issue is mostly is just the shame that society places that people feel about porn and they feel about the adult industry because, you know, my mother was a pornographer. And so I grew up the, the child of pornographers and people, you know, always ask me, well, you know, when did you find out and how did that affect you as a child? And like, it really didn't like my parents were always open and honest with me about it. I mean, you know, I didn't know specifics when I was young, like you said, I, I think I remember my parents telling me like, you know, we make movies for grownups and it's for grownups and you're not a grown up, So this is not like, you know, stuff that we're going to show you And the office is not a place for, for children. It's only for grownups. And I was like, okay, it's for grownups, you know? Um, and you know, for me, I had a wonderful childhood. I had parents who loved me. I had parents who supported me, who believed in me, um, who spent time with me. And that's really all children want. That's it. I think that if you can just like support and love your child, like what you do for a living is, is not going to turn them into like this psychopath, deviant monster that like can't handle society. Like it's just, that's such a, and it's interesting now that I have a daughter mm -hmm. because I'll get that same question. Well, aren't you worried about your kid? And I'm like, no, because I was raised by parents who do the exact same thing that I do. And like, mm -hmm. it didn't change me. And, you know, people might say, oh, well, you work in the adult industry, you know, you kind but of- that's not a bad into thing. The same it's not a bad thing, but also too, I can point to the fact that my brother's a lawyer and my sister's a doctor. I'm sorry, my sister's a nurse. So mm -hmm. like- totally have nothing to do with the adult industry. And they also love my parents. We're all incredibly close. Um, and that was just because my parents loved, supported and spent time with us. Yeah. Like their job is like irrelevant. Completely. You know, they provided for you and you said your parents were open and honest. If we want to look statistically at children who don't fare well as adults, some of the qualities that you listed, open, honesty, caring, supportive, present. Those are the things that usually are missing in the upbringing of a child who does not adjust well to adulthood. N n rarely is, a, is the parent's occupation the thing that's held over a criminal, right? Or someone who is not adjusted well. People don't say like, oh, her dad was a successful accountant, therefore. Like that is, you know, her dad wasn't present those kind of things might come up or her parents were abusive or their parents were abusive. Therefore, it's very rare that we go, their parents were astrophysics. Therefore, anything, you know, we even hear their parents were hardworking blue collar. It doesn't matter the job. That part never matters. It's the qualities that you just raised are like, that's what it takes to create an, a, a well-adjusted adult. And I've also heard from other sex workers who are parents that they find that their job actually makes them better parents in ways like they can kind of create their own schedule. And so they can really be there for their child when they get home from school on the weekends, you know, like they are very much in control of the hours that they work. And so they, they have the luxury to spend more time with their children. I want to even add some additional benefits to that, Holly, because like I'm all, I totally agree. Making your own schedule is fantastic, but that's usually like the one benefit that, that tends to be shared. I'm going to, I'm like going to push your listeners to hear, like they're going to be signing up for OnlyFans when they're done. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, more time and flexibility. One of the things that was so important for the kind of work, like 
I had already arrived. I was a therapist. I was licensed, passed the test, all respectable and suits and shit. Like, why would you go into porn? You know, people ask, like, why would you do that? Like, you had the, you, you, the, you made it. You know, was it desperation? Was it the student loans? I'm like, I'm not paying those still. Like, <laughs> it's not that. It was, I wanted to do this. I wanted to, I wanted to try something different at the same time as I was doing the thing that I do think I was born to do that too. And I wanted my children, my daughters to see like, you can just do what you want. You can do it. And if, and, and if it doesn't turn out okay, like I have a backup plan, I got a couple. But, you, but being able to make decisions as a woman was to me, a be and, and however I chose to show them, like that was the example that has been more important to me than what kind of job, you know? And like porn was, is definitely one of those things that's like, whoa, like mom, yeah, you know? And they were, they were like, you're gonna, I was like, yeah, I think like, I wanna do this. And, and so being able to even show your children an example of, of going against the grain and being okay with that. I'm not saying, cause I, I know for the both uh, of, of my two, of the three, the two daughters that are a little older of their, they really have shown like one is like, I might try the industry. The other one is like, oh no, not for me. It's all weird and that's okay. Um, but they they are able to make those uh, those strong opinions for themselves because they've been able to see a model of a woman that's just like I know what the consequences of this decision are. Um, I also know what the benefits of them, and I want to do that. Um, I understand other moms are not doing this, and I'm okay with defining what I the type of mother, the type of daughter, all those type of things. I'm okay with defining that for myself. That's been the benefit to to me as well. Other benefits, it's one of the only industries that is a female dominated financial industry. Like, I'm trying to cash in on that. And I want my daughters to to see that as well. Like of all of the things that I could choose and they know, I could charge X amount for therapy and still be considered an ethical therapist. I can do half that work for that for a quarter of that time and so I'm even showing my kids with with how I spend my time and what my my you know my own value is worth that I can make decisions on my value, my worth and how I want to spend my time. And those are things that you don't learn until like you're in your 30s if you're lucky. It's like they're seeing this now. What I'm literally saying to them, I'm actually going to take my therapy clients down by X amount and I'm going to raise my fetish work by X amount so that way over the summer I'm working this amount, but we're making this amount. They're learning, they're learning the value of time. They're learning the value of self. They're learning the value of just our economy. What's negotiable. Um, yeah. Those kind of things are like, yeah, I'm home with you more often, but what are you going to be learning while I am home with you more often? There's certain things that sex work has been able to afford me. Even my, my children coming and coming out to me to share their own, um, sexual expressions. I was not raised to be able to receive that information. I was raised as a Catholic Filipino girl. I was not raised to receive that information well. Sex work, not even therapy. Therapy is white and straight. Sex work prepared me to hear things as a parent and not have like a, a, a run hide, go find somebody else to tell face. Sex work has prepared me to go, okay, what does that mean for us as a family? How do we need me to show up? Who's bullying you? Who do I need to fight? That sex work has given me access to so many different walks of, of life and people's presentation of authentic self. That's allowed me to show up as a better parent, a better, um, you know, I'm, I'm the mom that the friends come to because they can't go to their parent. So I'm even a better parent on behalf of you because of sex work. So thank you, you know, like thank sex work. Yeah. <laughs> God, that, that's such a great point because you're absolutely right. I feel like especially this podcast has really like helped me grow as a person because it's really enabled me to sit down with different people, different walks of life, different gender identities, mm -hmm. um, sexual mm -hmm. preferences, identities, and it's I, it's made me a better person. Um, and and Lotus Lane actually touched on that when we did like this clubhouse speech, and I I, I really loved what she said, and she was talking about how her child is non-binary. And she was saying, you know, what a wonderful environment that we work in, you know, this sex work environment where we're so open and accepting of different people with different gender, sexual identities, all the things that 
enabled, you know, me to be able to accept my child's decision with like open arms because I am entrenched in a work environment that also accepts that with open arms. And I was like, that is such a great point. You know, I never thought about that way, but that's true. Like we are often so much more open-minded and compassionate um, because the adult industry itself is, it, it, it's definitely, it didn't used to be because I've been in the industry for a long time. It's mm-hmm. definitely grown mm-hmm. and it's embrace of, you know, um, the full community yes. has definitely improved. But I think also too, like that feeling of being ostracized a little bit from society, being the black sheep of the you entertainment industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you kind of like, you know what it's like to feel other a little bit, even if you're like a straight white woman like me, mm-hmm. you, know, you have a little mm-hmm. bit of that feeling. So, mm-hmm. you know, there's like more of a camaraderie with other people in the adult industry and an understanding of what it's like just a little bit to be like kind of judged for um, what just you do for a living. Who you are. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, com- uh, I, I com- completely agree with you. And, and these are, I, I always say sex workers are first responders. Um, and I, I come from a, a family much like you. It's like um, I, we have a therapist, a, a law enforcement, a teacher, and a doctor. And um, I go like I, I know my sisters, and and of course my skill sets that we come from our professional, our vanilla professions. And I'm like, yeah, as a sex worker, like I'm doing all of this stuff. Um, and it's you know people showing me pictures of things that they don't feel comfortable bringing to their provider. And I'm like, you should definitely have a doctor look at that and they're like you know and and I'm like you know like this is it's 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 easy like let's practice the conversation of you bringing this this conversation to your doctor um we're doing this in the sex work space this is not even happening in therapy this is on one of my platforms it's like hey can you look at this um or during during COVID how many people have been able to openly say I am so lonely I am craving attention and touch, if you can just take me to a place where I can envision or feel touch through, you know, through this virtual connection, like people being incredibly vulnerable, not in my therapy space, in my sex work space. And so I, and and talking to other sex workers and support groups and things of that sort, hearing people say like, I'm providing this skill set that is so beyond what society would, would at least, um, hold me, uh, uh, give me credit for, you know? Um, And I I do a lot of training other mental health therapists. And I'm saying like, listen, if you want a good feed of clients, go be friends with a good sex worker that is probably doing half of your vetting and your consultation work. Trust me, when we're in sexy time, we don't want to be doing therapy. We want to be able to go, I can refer you to someone. Let's talk, let's do the fantasy stuff and then follow up with my girl in the morning. You know, and so I'm always telling therapists that sex workers have incredible skill sets in empathy, in communication, in non-judgment, um, holding non-judgmental spaces, creating safety, boundary setting, goal setting. We we do it all the time using creative language, using our body, using, you know, all so many different mediums. And it's like, I, I, I just feel that we have so much more to, not even so much more to offer. I do, do think we're offering it. I just think we have a lot to com- to confront the stigma that is attached to our work. Um, you know, I do also think like, as, as you're mentioning, even between, between sex workers, I think it's important for us to know our value, um, to hear like, yeah, you're, you're actually doing the work of like three different therapists and a doctor. And I, you know, I'm not saying that you switch those hats and you go to that school. I'm just saying like, know your worth, know how important you are to people's wellness. And also know that if you can find some other, like how we're talking about like shopping for providers, like not even just for yourself, for your clients as well. Like I keep a, a, is this person LGBTQIA friendly for everything? Like a plumber, a attorney, a therapist, like I need to know before I send anyone anywhere, are they going to be judged when they walk through the door? And like, can we create these networks for each other, even outside of sex work to make sure that people are safe? Um, and I think that we've done a beautiful job in, in, in the sex work community. I'm with you. It hasn't always been this way. So if we're able to see our industry morph, especially an industry that is totally unregulated and doesn't have to act right, we could actually probably see the same thing happen in other spaces, therapy, medical health care, you know, those places 
financial banking system and their stigmas against sex workers in case anyone is listening. Oh God. Yeah. I don't even get me started on that. <laughs> I know. God. Yeah. That's yeah. What are, yeah. I mean, just uh, even though like I love my own uh, community, like talking to you makes me feel like even more inspired about like that. I definitely chose the right uh, career path for myself because I do think we are like a special bunch of people. Well, Jasmine, thank you so much. This has been uh, such an amazing interview. I feel like we could go on forever, but uh, we both have other commitments and um, other other people we have to tend to. <laughs> As so, mentioned. <laughs> yeah, so sadly, we do have to wrap this up. Can you tell everybody where they can find you online? Absolutely. I am on all social media platforms under Jet Set Jasmine. And my main website is Jet Setting Jasmine. If you'd like to see some of the production work that I talked about, you can take a look at royalfetishxxx.com. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And don't hate me, but I started a TikTok. Yes, I feel kind of old on that platform, but um, whatever. <laughs> I caved. So follow me on TikTok, Holly Randall Unfiltered. And um, of course, to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Jasmine, again, thank you. You are amazing, beautiful soul. And I'm so glad that we finally got to do this. Likewise, look forward to talking to you again. Take care. Yes. Bye.